rejection to me is always much better than regret. I would always oh, try it. For sure. With that said, you know, another key to my success has been to learn from my no's. You know, I get a no, I'm not going to just go and like mm -hmm. melt and squalor. Like if you're going to be putting yourself out there, it's actually insane to think that you wouldn't hear a no. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You should actually expect no's. And for me, if someone gets a lot of no's, I'm like, yes, because that means that you're making a lot of pitches. Yeah. Yes. Because you can't get a lot of no's if you're not making a lot of pitches. That's a great point. And I tell all of my students, for every yes that you get, I want you to anticipate and expect 100% at least 15 no's. Yeah. So that is always my thing. And it's like, if you're not pitching 30, 50 people at, for one project or at one time, you're not pitching enough. And I think that's the other thing is that either people hear no and they just let that completely freeze them up yep. or they'll pitch once or twice. It didn't work. So it doesn't work. All right. So today on the podcast, we have Julie Solomon, who, hello, hello. <laughs> who also is a podcaster. It's called the Influencer Podcast, which is a very good podcast. If you really want to learn something, I definitely recommend it because I was telling Julie before we started, when I was listening to some of the episodes, it was such valuable information that you give. Um, but we'll get into that in a moment. She's obviously a speaker, and now an author of the new book called Get What You Want. Yes. I love the title. Thank you. And a business coach. Yeah. And you do it all. I do it all. And a mom. And a mom. <laughs> Mama too. Mom of two. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the beginning. How did you let the whole process? Because now this is a new book for you. And your book actually, like I said, it really resonated with me. And lots of things were uh, very familiar. Uh, you talk about having an origin story. So why don't we start with what is your origin story yeah. and the importance of having one? Yes. So um, I, I, I'm going to back up just a little bit to talk about what is an is an origin story and then and then mine. Um, an origin story, and I share it in the book, is really a story that we all have. It is the essentially the stories, the beliefs, the thoughts that make up how we think and feel in the world today. So based off of where we're from, how we were raised, who we were raised by, um, you know, any type of, you know, religious affiliation we may have, it makes up a lot of how we look at and see the world from our own specific lens. And uh, we, in, in kind of the Hollywood realm, we see origin stories a lot with comic book characters, mm -hmm. right? They all come from this, you know, this situation and they have this hero's journey and, you know, they're saving the world with their hot bodies. And so I talk <laughs> about that in my book and, and my origin story was, was one of, you know, a small town girl was raised by two um, people that did not have college degrees. My dad literally wore a blue collar to work every day. Um, my mom, when she was 16, she ran away from home and married my dad and then had my brother when she was 17. So it was a lot of that kind of cultural, small town way of living. Um, and it was also one of just scarcity. Um, and it was one of just a very, you know, not a lot of culture. I wasn't, I didn't, everyone in my town was basically just small town Baptist Christian. Um, if you were Catholic, that was weird. So you can imagine like anything else outside of that. And um, it was, it was a very kind of scarce sheltered environment. And so I was taught at a very young age just to believe that as long as you have enough money to pay the bills, that's really all that you should be thinking of, um, that it's not really, you know, normal to think outside of the box or to think creatively or to really do anything other than what you're seeing day to day. And so um, when I was seven, my parents divorced and my mom moved to Nashville. And then a few years later, she married my now stepdad and he had the exact opposite of my life. Very, very wealthy man, um, you know, hardworking, built his business from the ground up. And from that, I was privileged enough to then be thrusted into this whole new society that I never even knew existed. And um, he was very, very kind to um, enroll me into a private school so I could get a better education. And then from there, I started meeting people from all different walks of life. You know, a ton of my friends that were Jewish, I was telling you about <laughs> yeah, that earlier. Yeah, yeah. I started going, you know, to Ba and bat mitzvahs. I didn't even know like how to say or spell that from where I was from. And so it was, it was opening my eyes up to this new possibility and to this new way of living. But at the same time, I still felt because of my origin story, like I don't belong here. 
this is not mine. I always kind of felt like I was on the outside looking in, like I was here, but I wasn't really here. And I didn't earn any of this. This None of this is mine. So I was given this privilege, but it was really hard to feel worthy of, you know, these new opportunities that I were ha- that I started to have. And so this kind of double-edged sword of being able to have possibility, but then not feeling worthy of it and feeling that all I really was worthy of was more of this scarcity mm. kind of blue collar working mentality. It, it, caused a lot of this tug of war to me that I would would think big. I always wanted to get out of the small town. I always had dreams of moving to New York and moving to Los Angeles, both of which I ended up doing as I got older. Um, But there was still this kind of upper limit fear of you're a fraud. Someone's going to find out that you're not supposed to be here. Who do you think you are? You know, it was kind of that internal dialogue was playing out, even though I was relentless in my desire to want to have something more out of life. You know, it's interesting. I find that that happens. Like that's a a lot of people who come from your background have that. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of how do you tell people when you talk on your podcast and all the experience that you have, how did you break out of that for your own story and change your, your origin story? Yeah. Uh, Because those thoughts become your reality, right? Yeah, they do. And you, 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 but your body yourself, you become those thoughts. So Mm. what's the, how do you do that? How do you change that? Cause that does change the trajectory of your entire life. Yeah. Um, I think it can show up in different ways for me. Fortunately and unfortunately, it came with, you know, some really tough lessons and some rock bottoms. So um, one that I can talk about kind of professionally and, and I kick off the book with this is that I get a call from my husband that's on right. a cell phone, I'm sitting at the the dinner table and just working and I get a call and I answer it and I said, hello. And he just said, hey, babe, when were you going to tell me about the credit card? And I was frozen because unbeknownst to him, even though he knew at that moment, I had been hiding over $30,000 of credit card debt from him that I had acquired over three years. And the reason for the credit card debt is that I was this new mom. I felt alone and lost. I was, you know, having postpartum stuff. And then that just kind of transpired into this delusion that spending and buying things would feel some mm-hmm. kind of void inside me. And before I knew it, I was three years in and $30,000 in, and now my husband had found out. And so in that moment, I had to really get honest with myself about why am I so afraid to be honest about money? Why am I so afraid to be honest about spending? Why am I so afraid to be honest about managing money? Why am I so afraid to be honest about my fear around money? Why do I have fear around money? And so it was, it was that rock bottom moment of not only having to start to mend my marriage and thank God he didn't leave me in that moment. And he stuck with me to get through that, but then also had to start getting really honest about a lot of these things that I think I had just kind of pushed down and just told myself, it's fine. I'll figure it out. It's not a big deal. You know, everything will work out. Some financial fairy God person will come down from the sky and it will be fine. You know, it was just years of kind of numbing myself into this delusion of everything was fine. And then it all kind of hit to this point. But the gift of that, and we can talk about this, is it, if it was that moment at the kitchen table where, you know, I made that decision that whatever this is, you know, not to say that my life is all horrible. I have a lot of great things about my life that I love, but I also have this, this really dark part that I need to face. And if I don't, it's just going to keep rearing its ugly head. And so I made the decision at that moment to then go and to start to really look at myself in new ways and look at this challenge that I had. And from that, I was able to kind of, you know, come out of the ashes and and build the business that I now have today. So, but did you try to figure out why you had that, what you became as like, it was like you were kind of a spending addict, like to kind of fulfill something, Absolutely. a hole in you that you felt like you were not good enough. Yeah. And so you were buying a lot of material things. Yes. What were you buying? Lipstick, lip gloss, you know, and th- that's the other thing. I think that's a great question because I kept justifying my spending habits because I would say to myself, well, it's not like I'm going down to Rodeo Drive and buying, you know, 15 right. pairs of Louis Vuittons. I'm going to Sephora and buying a $30 lip gloss. 
Right. But over time, it adds, those, up. It adds up. And so it, it didn't, and that didn't even matter. I mean, that was just a way that I was rationalizing my very sick behavior. Right. But it, it was, no matter what I was spending, I was spending and I was hiding it and it was actually causing a lot of detriment to my life. But more than that, you were feeling a hole that you had. Right, so, of not feeling worthy, of not feeling seen, of not feeling heard, of, you know, uh, I think also to this void of shame that I had around, you know, I would always say these things to myself of like, well, I've never been good with math, I'm not good with numbers, you know, um, the society that I grew up in, it's like the man takes care of that. Mm -hmm. So I was always waiting for this like, other thing outside of me to come in and take care of the finances. I didn't need to learn about savings. I didn't need to learn about budgeting. Somebody else is going to come and do that for me. And then I'm just going to be like, I guess the, the woman, whatever that meant, you whatever know, that whatever right. that meant. And so I think that, you know, starting to realize like, well, what does that mean? And that's actually not the reality of my life at all. And it, it, like, I, I need to really unravel what this is and get to the root of why I have such deep shame around money and around being honest about money and around just even my lack of understanding of some financial things at the time, which is totally okay because you don't know what you don't know. No, exactly. And so then how, so then what's the first step? Because if you're, if your origin story and the story that you tell yourself and the thoughts are, I'm not good enough, you have shame, you come from this, you have, you have a lot of um, limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. let's say, okay, now you acknowledge it, you, that that was kind of a way the having to tell your husband, that was a way to confront somebody and put it out there. So from that moment, you, you, there's a lot missing between that to getting where you are now, right? Yeah. So how do people, what is it, it, what's the first step after the acknowledgement to start building a different origin story? Yeah. So for me, it's the awareness is the first step being aware of the reality of the situation as it is mm -hmm. and just really, really giving yourself the gift of being present enough to be aware. Because if you are in doing mode, if you do not give yourself the time to be still, to pause, to think and feel, if you're just constantly going and deflecting and ignoring, you can't be aware. Right. So it was the awareness. And then the second step for me was accepting it which I think is the hardest thing, at least it was for me. And I think for a lot of people, it's easy to be aware of something and then just want to go and fix it. But to really like sit in that uncomfortable acceptance of something of this is what happened. I did this. I created this. I accept that I have gotten myself here. Now, what am I going to do about it? Right. And, and that's the third step for me, which is those action steps. So for me, it was, you know, starting to figure out more about budgeting. I took a lot of classes on finances. I went to conferences. I, I love to research things. I'm like a sponge. So it was the courses and like anything that I could get my hands on. Um, and then also being mindful of, I want my husband to be a part of this, but I also don't want to put it on him because this is not his problem. This is my this is my challenge and really wanting to own that. So once I started to be aware and accept what my strengths and weaknesses was, then I could then go and get help. I went to therapy as well. Um, I started to also talk to financial planners and advisors to be like, hey, I'm going to need support along this path. I am not someone I haven't I don't have the learned behavior of properly managing money in a way that I don't overspend. So I'm going to need guidance and support in this way. Way. Um, not in a way that makes me feel like a financial toddler, but a way that, <laughs> that helps me be in support of my goals and where I want to go. No, I get that. So that's kind of also to me, you're, you're taking action on the behavior, mm -hmm. but still, so, in, or, or are you saying you taking action at all on the behavior is helping repair your belief system and what, who you are, yes. because you're getting, you're, you're taking ownership saying, this is what I'm bad at. Um, and I'm going to get better at this to kind of build your confidence a little bit more. Correct. And yeah. it's, it's when we allow our origin stories to dictate our lives is when we know that we're in trouble. Right. So for me, it was the awareness of what the origin story was and, and those beliefs and why, and why, yeah. and, and why, you know, the belief systems that I were having to say, look, the origin that's past anyways, that is from the origin of my existence. So I see that. Thank you for teaching me what I needed to know. Now you can stay there and I'm going to create a new story and I'm going to create a new script. And I believe that when you change the script, the script changes. 
Yeah. And so that was the gift of me being able through action to write a new story and to set new limits and to create new boundaries and all of those things that came with it that allowed me to live in in a more healthy parameter around money. So then well, after like, so after college, because you were a publicist, weren't mm-hmm. you for yes. music? Yep. Um, was it just music? Or? Music and, and books. And music and, yeah. and books, right? And books. Because you did, I saw you like music. I saw I saw Dave Ramsey and mm-hmm. a, a bunch. Of, was that in New York then? That was back in Nashville. So I did music PR in in New York, and then I did book PR in Nashville. And that was the other thing too. It was like here I was, you know, working on books about Dave Ramsey, which is all about financial freedom and savings, and, <laughs> and that's the irony, yeah, right? It is. That it's, Life is like that. Though. It is. I mean, some sometimes the you know the universe will put exactly what you need right in front of your face. But if you're not aware, you're not going to see it. Exactly. I think also not just to be aware, but be honest, what it is to be aware, but being honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. Cause I think people don't want to like kind of face reality a lot of times and that's why they're deflecting. And that's why it's being aware of your weaknesses, your strengths. And so are you a person that believes, cause there's like two different ways of thinking, right? One is to go all in on your strengths and then like, kind of like find someone else to like help you with your weaknesses to kind of balance it out. Or, or I think you are this kind of person because you just said with the finance that if you, if you are aware and you know what these weaknesses are, you help lift up those weaknesses to balance out your strengths. What do you like? Is that what you believe? Yeah, I, I would say so. I believe that if you want to be a leader, whether that's in your home or in a business or whatever it is, there's going to be pieces to that puzzle that even if you're not the person that is that is in charge of that piece of the puzzle, I still believe that you have to understand it, at least conceptually. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the inner workings of how something works, why it is the way that it is to to get a grasp of understanding. So you can be, um, I believe, responsible and have the ability to respond to things. Now, you don't want me doing taxes, but I can conceptually understand why we're paying the taxes that we're paying. You don't want me, you know, filing your taxes, but I can conceptually understand what my CPA needs in order to file the taxes on yeah. my behalf. So like you have to like, and this is what I talk about too. And I, I think I did a podcast. I was it Patrick, but David, I don't remember, but it was about certain things like being curious or interested. You may be someone who's a total introvert, let's say right. for example, but like if you're in sales, you have to if you have to like take that weakness and you may not be a 10 out of 10 but take that you know 2 out of 10 and make it a 4 right right so you don't have to be like a superstar in these weaknesses but you at least have to bring it up a little bit more yes and to to kind of at least make it manageable so you don't, so yes. you can, so you can win right yeah. and it also allows you to understand at a deeper level what kind of support you actually need which is going to actually help you save time and money in the long run you know before i was aware of certain things i would just hire out everything because it was just like fix it fix it fix yes. it throw in spaghetti at the wall i don't want to deal with it just fix it but if i don't understand conceptually what i actually yeah. need to 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 meet my goal and reach my goal then i may be giving somebody a job or a task that i don't even need i may have i may you know pay for a coach or a consultant or some kind of freelancer on my team or hire someone yeah. that may not even need to be there in the first place that's a, and, and you can waste a lot of money doing a lot, that and i have a, a lot a, really expensive expensive mistakes on that stuff. hundred percent. And that's where I think we can set a good segue into, you know, you talk about this too, like creating a blueprint for yourself, mm. right? So if you have a clear mind, you have a clear vision of where you're going. Otherwise you're just like throwing darts at the wall. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, so then if you're in public, so if you're now doing PR mm-hmm. for all these different people, what, how did you ricochet into like, from being that to where you now, like you are a business coach, you have this podcast, which is very, very much about educating and ed- mm-hmm. like telling people how to build their own brands and business stuff, influencers. Um, like there was like, give us the, the, the meat before yeah. that. You know what I mean? So how did you go from being that PR person and having this blueprint to being this person? Yeah. So around the time that, you know, the money situation happened. And if I can remember, this was probably around 2015, Um, at the same time, coincidentally enough, I was really losing my, 
my zest and my love and my passion for the PR work. That industry as a whole was just changing dramatically. Social media was becoming more of a thing. Yeah. I was living in Los Angeles at the time, which was the mecca. Oh, of, not New York for the PR? No, I, I had lived there and then um, had moved back to Nashville for some time and then met my husband and moved to LA. So I had been doing PR that whole time. Who are you working with, by the way? What com- in New York? Yeah. A company called Press Here Publicity. Oh, no, I don't know them. Okay. And then um, went in house with Harper Collins and did book publicity mm. and, you know, like the early teens moved to um, LA, started freelancing and I was just losing my zest. And I was seeing that this whole world of influencer marketing and social media and all of that was coming up. And I got into blogging because when I first moved to LA again, I was alone and doing nothing but spending money behind my husband's back. And (laughs) so didn't have anything else to do. So I did the one thing that every woman does when she moves to LA, which was start a blog back then. That's what you started with. That's what I started with. What were you blogging about? Motherhood, lifestyle, fashion, just what, again, throw it, just testing things out, you know, whatever kind of felt, felt good at the time. And what was great about that is that I started to, it ended up, ended up kind of being a case study of sorts because the, the very, the very content that I was creating ended up being the type of content that I started coaching people on a few years later. Mm. I just didn't know that that's what was happening. So, um, I was able to quickly monetize my blog because of my experience as a publicist and really understanding the marketing side of things. And so I had women that started coming up to me and saying, you know, how is it that you have like just a few thousand followers and you're making all this money and I have hundreds of thousands of followers and I'm not really making any money. And it's because they weren't looking at the influencer marketing world through that lens. Everybody at that time, they were just more focused on like being popular and having a lot of followers. They weren't treating it like a business. Right. So I started to get more excited about that while at the same time started to lose my passion for PR. And um, I was working with a PR client at the time on a book. It was extremely stressful. My entire body broke out in hives. As you know, your your body will tell you what is going mm-hmm. on with you. Um, I was exhausted. My cortisol levels were shot. I was just, I was a disaster. And I remember looking in the mirror and I was just like, who is this person? I don't even, I don't even recognize this person. And it was that kind of moment of exhaustion that gave me the clarity about the pivot that I needed to make. And I think a lot of times for people, they they don't think they can get what they want because they don't know what they want. But I always say, if you know what you don't want, you know what you do want because you know what you don't want. And so for me, it was getting clear on like, whatever this is, I don't want this anymore. But you needed to go through that to know it. I did, yes. You have to a lot of times kiss a lot of frogs to get mm-hmm. to that Prince Charming. I hate that expression, but it's the truth. It's true. Right? Like you, well, how you figure out what you want is by doing a lot of shit that you don't want to do. That you don't want. Right. right. And if you didn't do that PR, you would never even known that that was something that you didn't want to do. But you got a lot of transferable skills from that. I got a ton. It, you, I mean, it laid the foundation for 100%. everything that I do now. And then for you sure. Use, and you use them. Like talk about, and I, it was in the book, this story to me. I was just blown away by the remodeling story. Yeah. yeah. Because that, you took a lot of the same, those skills from PR. Can you just tell that story? Yeah. So I had hit the rock bottom with the money. I was having all of this, you know, this kind of identity crisis with the PR side. It's all I had ever known and done. Well, at the same time, I was in this really kind of special and unique time in Los Angeles of now being around all of these influencers and these bloggers, really they were called bloggers at the time and these content creators and changing the names. Yeah. That like that wanted to kind of grow this thing. And so it was, it was kind of a, a domino effect of these things happening at once. So I had told myself, I said, look, if I'm getting this, this inkling to stop PR, it's, I'm not passionate about it anymore. Um, it's okay to have permission to pivot your passions. I knew that my purpose was to impact and connect and communicate, and that was never going to change. But my passion was changing. Um, but I had to make money from it. Now I had this debt that I had to pay off, and like I had to hustle and figure this out quickly. So and you were vlogging and all that blogging. Was, yes, blogging and doing YouTube and and all of that stuff. And so I realized I started to get invited to some blogger events, and there were always brands that were there. And what was interesting was that 
the majority of the bloggers at the time would just be sitting in the corner, like talking to each other or looking at their phone scrolling. And then you would have these brands and the brands are the money that would be sitting over here and no one talking to them. So just being who I am and with my background, it's very natural for me to go up and start having conversations with brands. And it's all part of marketing and networking. And if you're if you're in sales, you're in sales, whether you want to admit it or not, or believe it or not, this is all sales. All of this. You could sell yourself all day. All day long. And even if you're an entrepreneur, you're a salesperson. Yes, you right? are. Like and pe so people don't like that name, but that's what it is. But it's the truth. Yeah. And so I just started to say hi and connect and build relationships with these brands. And then I would say, hey, I have an idea. You know, I I would love to create content for you. I do, I talk about motherhood stuff and lifestyle stuff. And so little by little, I would start making deals, 500 here, $1,500 there, $2,500 there. And I had told myself, I was like, if I could just make $5,000 a month, you know, on this side hustle, that would, that for some reason, that number was the number that I made up and told myself that that's going to be the parameter. If I can't get to that, then it's going to be a waste. But if I can just get to that, then I can start to kind of supplement. I don't have to take on as much PR work and then I can slowly build to what I need. So I got to that point and I started to get there consistently. And then I started to get to $10,000 a month and then $15,000 a month and then $20,000 a month. And then I kind of stayed around that 15,000 to 20,000. And it was still kind of a little bit of PR work, mostly, you know, monetizing my platform, but I didn't really have a big platform. And so I knew that I had to, and kind of at the time people were coming to me and, and kind of at, they were curious, they're like, how are you doing this? And, um, and so during that time and people are kind of paying attention, I at our house, my son was <laughs> becoming, he was going from being a baby to being a big boy. And we needed to transform his room. And because I was in all this debt, I was like, well, I can't ask my husband to like, hey, I know I, you know, owe our family $30,000, but do you now want to, you know, pay for all this new furniture that I want to do for my son's room? So I was like, okay, so I'm gonna have to figure out how to get this room furnished. So I started pitching brands about, you know, I think my pitch was like, a stay, you know, a work from home mom has to, you know, renovate her home and create the work life balance that's needed to not only be able to work successfully from home, but then to also be a mom. And um, the majority of people were like, no, <laughs> like yeah. cute, but no. Yeah. And, and again, you have to, I don't, I didn't have a lot of followers, so I couldn't fall back on this big follower number. And then I also wasn't the content creator that was sitting front row at fashion week or, you know, I right. wasn't, there was nothing about me as a content creator that stuck out. The only thing, and I didn't realize this at the time, but the only thing that was, that stuck out for me, that was my secret sauce was my understanding of pitching mm -hmm. and how to pitch myself. And so I got a lot of no's, which I'm cool with getting, you know, in order to get a yes, you got to get a lot of no's first. So people kept saying no to me. And, um, and instead of just saying, okay, never mind, I was like, well, why are they saying no? Like, there has to be something that they want that they find valuable. They just don't find what I'm initially pitching them valuable. Right. So I got curious and I asked, I'm like, well, what would be valuable to you? You know, and everyone had an array of different answers. But this one brand said, well, you know, like press and media, like, you know, not only traditional media, but like blog hits and, you know, social media hits, like we would love to get some big press. And, you know, unfortunately, Julie, like you don't, you have like 10 people that look at your website. So like, you can't do that for us, but that's what we would love. So then I was like, okay, well, huh. So like, I may not be able to give them that through like me, but maybe I can give them that in some other kind of way. So then I was like, well, let me pitch some media outlets that have the dot com side and the blog side to see if they would be interested. So, and, you, and by the way, I want to make a point why I want you to tell the story is because it is about taking your, I think, your transferable skills as a publicist. Yes, that's everything that it was. Right. And you're now like using it for something else that you gained maximum value on, which you'll continue. Yes. So, so then I went to media and I went to like, you know, at the time it was like mom.me and pop sugar moms and modern moms and all these mom sites. And, um, some of them, you know, were, were interested, but it was at the time they were just so hungry for content. Mm -hmm. Like any of them were like, sure, if you want to write this article, sure. But at, at the time people magazine and specifically people.com were starting a like mom focused 
area area section. on on the dot com side. So they were interested, and I was like, okay, well, People Magazine, like we're not effing around. Like this is a big. That's better than all the other that's ones you better mentioned. Better than all of them combined. So I went back to this brand, and I said, okay, so People dot com is interested in this. Um, wanted to throw that out there to see what you think. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Like, you know, yeah, let's do this. But then I started thinking, well, what if I could get like more than just a room done? <laughs> like, let's just see. And the this is house. where like, I, I'm thinking big, you know, go big or go home. Yes. And so I went back to people.com and I was like, well, I know that I originally had mentioned, you know, the my, my son's room, but what do you guys think about kind of doing like an entire like home makeover? And if we did that, like how big could we make this? You know, what are the options? And people were like, well, we could put it on our dot com. We could, you know, we could have links that link back to the brand retailer site. We could do like a scroll of photos, like just letting me know what's available. Um, and so then I went back to the brand and I said, OK, guys, so people's interested in this. But in order to do it, we're going to have to do the entire house. And if we do that, you're going to get social media. You're going to get dot com. Of course, you have like anything that I can offer you as well. They will link it back to your to your retailer site. And then, of course, at that point, it was just a no brainer. Yeah. And so, then you got like a two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. So what ended up being an idea ended up becoming over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in furniture. We we redid my son's room, <laughs> our bedroom, the living room. Um, and like this little office room that we had. And then also um, the company, which is which was World Market at the time, they're amazing. They were working with another company called Decorous, which is an interior design firm. And so then they brought the interior design firm on and I got it got I got it completely designed. And that was comped as well. Amazing. And then I got media too. Amazing that they didn't like, because a lot, what could have happened too, is they'll be like, this is a great idea. Let's find someone who's a bigger influencer or a celebrity and just put it in there. Well, that's ended up, I was the first person to ever do this. So if you look back now, that's what they, we did this together. And then they were like, oh, this is amazing. So then they started going decorous in world market. They started going after all like the people from the bachelor, the bachelorette, like so a smart. lot of big reality stores have now done this very formula that I didn't even know that I was creating, but because I was the first, I set the tone for the whole thing. Yeah, and, amazing. And at the time that that really, it goes to show that just people weren't thinking in that way. And as you said, with my skill set of pitching, I didn't even know a, another way to think. That's, that's the only way that I knew how to think when it came to marketing. And then when, when other content creators and bloggers saw this happen, they were like, what have you, what is going on? What year and was then this? That, that, this was 2016. Okay. And then that cracked open what became my very first course called yeah. Pitch It Perfect, which teaches bloggers, content creators, influencers, anyone who wants to work with brands, because people like to label themselves, however, but it teaches you how to do the very thing that I share in the book, which is think of a really great idea, pitch it to somebody who wants it and make a lot of money doing it. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I, I, that's why I wanted you to tell the story. That was your first course too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that so, course has now gone on to be, it's a multi seven figure course. Wow. And, it's so, a, and there's a good reason for it though, because you're teaching a very valuable skill to people that may come easy to you because right. you have those skills, but that could be like the, the kind of the stop and start for somebody. Cause they don't know, they don't, you don't know what you don't know. Nobody does. Right. right. And that can open up a whole like plethora of other mm -hmm. opportunities for somebody. And I think it's important to, to share this because the, the, the biggest thing that probably someone watching or listening to this right now, they, they're probably saying like, well, easy for Julie to say she was a publicist. Like, of course it worked out for her. Right. But it's also like, but I wasn't all of those other things. And a lot of those things didn't work out for me. So instead of already giving yourself a reason to not try and just to kind of like mm -hmm. cop out of it, think about what do you have? Yeah, you may not have PR experience, but what is unique to you? And the, the a great example that I love to give one of my students who actually, if you walk into a an Ulta store right now, you're going to see her beautiful face splashed all over the inside of, of an Ulta. Her niche is her curly hair. That's literally all she pitches all day is the hair on her head. Really? And from, the, yes, she's a curly hair influencer and she gets every deal, every curly hair product deal, it, it's going to her. And she was the first of the kind to think about using her curly hair. So now there's this whole niche of curly hair influencers that work with all of these brands that are targeted for curly hair. And so I just, I think that's important because yeah, yeah. it's literally the hair on her head. <laughs> like yeah. that's all that it is. And so if you think that you don't have a niche or if you think that you don't have an expertise, 
just look in the mirror. You may be surprised with what you find. No, I think that's exactly what I, why I, I love the story, especially with the curly hair one too. I mean, mm-hmm. it's true. People don't see themselves. They, they're very limited a lot of times because they, because of their, their thoughts origin story and their mm-hmm. origin story. So then let's go through, I, I know I kind of like fast forwarded to the pitch, uh, pitch perfect, but Let's go into the blueprint because I, I think that's very important, right? Yep. Because you're all about creating a path for success to get what you want. That would be a major step, I would imagine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, the first step that I say in the blueprint is, you know, I started I started where I was with what I had. And I, and I gave myself the freedom to do that. You know, I didn't shame myself for not being like that person or that person or not having a hundred thousand followers or whatever thing that I could make an excuse. I literally start with what I had it. And that's the same thing with like the curly hair. It's like, what do you have? Do you wear glasses? Are you plus size? Do you have some kind of niche? You know, I have thousands of students now that have gone through the program and it's like every I have a scuba diver I have you know a bartender that became really well known as like this cocktail connoisseur and she makes all of these exquisite amazing beautiful cocktails and she gets sponsored by you know spirit brands and liquor brands and you know glass companies you name it and they're working with her so it's it's about you know and she got to leave her bartending job to become right. like the top in her field in in this arena so what is it that makes you special and unique even if you don't think it's special and unique what is that thing that you have that could someone else could see a value so it's about starting where you are with what you have giving yourself the permission to pivot giving yourself the permission to test different things out um, that's another step. Another step is when it comes to how do you do that though? Giving yourself permission to pivot. No, to test things out. How do you tell somebody to test, test things out? You, you do it. So it's like, Hey, I'm going to test out, um, you know, this video and see if it works. And that's why I still have, if oh, you this look, is all social media based, you're talking, right? Or it can be, it doesn't okay. have to be. Okay. So it's like, let's say if somebody says, I want to be a writer, well, then you got to write. So start testing it out, start writing things out, seeing how it feels, seeing how it sticks. Most importantly to you first, you know, how does it feel for you? Does it feel in alignment? Does it light you up? Does it feel like, you know, excited? Do you feel expansive when you think about it? Are you just like, you know, but you're not going to know, you're not going to be able to tap in and tune in to any of that until you actually test things out. And so I gave myself permission to just pitch things and it's like, Maybe it was horrible. I don't know. It's those people are they're they're too busy thinking about themselves. They're not going to be thinking about, oh gosh, that horrible pitch that girl sent us. Like they're not thinking about that. So you have to kind of get out of your way a little bit and 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 we all do this. It's very normal, but we think that like the world revolves around us totally. and we get so worried and nervous that we're going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or mess up. But give yourself permission to be messy. Give yourself permission to test things out. That's where that's where the answers are. Yeah. You know, I said something I did a thing recently where I said the two biggest like two big life lessons have been for me mm-hmm. is that caring what people think and then actually thinking that they care. Right. Because nobody cares. <laughs> nobody people does. Are so like are so focused on themselves. Yes. That like they're not paying attention to you. Yes. But again, it's like people need that constant reminder mm-hmm. because they don't even give themselves that shot to try because they're so caught up in looking stupid and feeling like they, you know, like they look that they're going to embarrass themselves. Mm-hmm. Like, Rejection to me is always much better than regret. I would always try it. For sure. Right? And so I like what you're saying. I think it's extremely important for people who are not thinking in this way Mm -hmm. to start thinking that way. Yeah. And I think also, too, with that said, you know, another another key to my success has been to learn from my no's. You know, I get a no. I'm not going to just go and, like, Mm -hmm. melt and squalor. Like, if you're going to be putting yourself out there... It's actually insane to think that you wouldn't hear a no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You should actually expect no's. And for me, if someone gets a lot of no's, I'm like, yes, because that means that you're making a lot of pitches. Yeah. Yes. Because you can't get a lot of no's if you're not making a lot of pitches. That's a great point. And for every, and I tell all of my students, for every yes that you get, I want you to anticipate and expect 100% at least 15 no's. Yeah. So that is always my thing. And it's like, if you're not pitching... 30, 50 people 
it, at, for one project or at one time, you're not pitching enough. And I think that's the other thing is that either people hear no and they just let that completely freeze them up yep. or they'll pitch once or twice it didn't work. So it doesn't work. It's like, no, it's, that's like saying, Hey, I got in a car and backed out, but I didn't make it to the highway. So driving a car doesn't work. Yeah. No, I think it's very true. You didn't even get on the street. (laughs) No. And I I think exactly. And I think that's very true. Like if you're not getting a lot of no's, it's because you're not pitching enough. Yeah. Right. You're not making a lot of offers. You're not giving people a lot of options to work with you. And if you're not going to be your biggest fan and root for yourself, then who else will? Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you're not confident, you can't expect someone else to be confident in in your skills or hiring you or making you an expert. If you come to the table kind of without feeling that way. Right. And even if you kind of don't feel that way, like kind of, I, I know this whole like fake it till you make it, but the more you act as if you become that person. Absolutely. And I love that you touched on confidence because what I have discovered, and I don't know if you've experienced this too. I mean, I'm sure you did with your tech talk, but for me, confidence, I feel like people wait, they tell themselves like, I have to be confident first to do X, X y, y, and Z. Yeah. So once I'm confident, then I'm going to be able to write the TED talk mm-hmm. or write the book or speak on the stage or make the pitch or whatever. But for me, I've learned that confidence actually comes from clarity and clarity comes from the action of testing it out and trying it. I agree. I'm sure that you speaking on that TED talk stage gave you a lot more confidence than you had before you walked on the stage. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, well, I was very, by the way, Super, super scared. Of my biggest, my biggest fear. I, I hate public speaking, which is mm-hmm. why. And I, I, I got it very differently. They came to me versus me having to apply. Mm-hmm. And you know, for a very brief moment, I was going to say no because it was so scary for me. The idea is very fearful of public mm-hmm. speaking. But that's why I said yes. And I went on that stage very, very fearful. But that's sometimes how you get over your fear is by actually putting yourself in the fire, right? Because nothing's ever as bad as you think it's going to be, right? Right? Like you think, oh my God, this is going to happen. But like, it's always worse in your head than what it really is. And then you finish something and then you're like, wow, I actually did it. It wasn't that bad. And that action is momentum based. And then that builds on confidence. People are not going to be confident by sitting on their couch, eating bonbons, watching (laughs) Netflix and thinking that, oh, it's going to come to them one day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't. And and also looking outside of themselves. Like I can't tell you how many times I'll have a student who's kind of more new to everything. And, you know, I can tell that she doesn't have the confidence yet because she's afraid to try. Right. And she's like, Julie, do you have any, you know, um, programs or podcast episodes, or can you like direct me to somewhere on Google where I can figure out how to be more confident. And I'm like, girl, confidence is an inside job. Yeah. Like, no, I don't. And I'm going to put this back on you that as much as you try to look outside yourself to find it, it's it's not going to come until you put yourself in the fire to take that action and to remind yourself, oh, wow, I'm still alive today. <laughs> I didn't die. This is great. A hundred percent. I think also now the word confidence is being used so much mm. And there's all these like there's confident podcasts, there's confidence this, there's confidence that. And the reality is exactly to what you just said is what I say, which is don't look outside because mm-hmm. you have the power to be your own confident person by just doing just doing shit. Right. You know, that's the best way. Like it's, it's, there's no like magic pill. There's no like real formula, but like you doing creates confidence. Yes. Period. And even the word, it's like confident confide in it's like you confiding in yourself yeah, totally. for the answers and for the guidance absolutely so now now I'm, I'm missing where i was going to go with this though you were talking about the blueprint and how we took yeah so continue with this whole continue with that because that's very important to getting what you want once you have the blueprint then what do you do then you can start putting it into action. And so you, you, you know, you're, you've given yourself permission to go for it. You're, you're testing things out, you're opening it up. And then at that point, it's about making the offer. So whatever offer, and this could be something is like, even if you're just a stay at home mom, we're always pitching something, whether we realize it or not, right. we've got to pitch our you know children on what we want them to eat for dinner. We've got to pitch our husband on what television show we right. want to watch tonight. We're always <laughs> in that, in that mindset. <laughs> so so true. like you could even test it out at home first. Just try, you know, just just kind of try out if, if you're if you're wanting to make an offer out in the world, start small, make an offer to your husband and see what happens. See if you can end up getting what you want in the process of collaboration and negotiation and, you know, 
putting it out there. If he says no, okay, you can wait, you can pivot, you can try to ask the question in a different kind of way. So I know what I was going to ask you after that was the resistance part, kind Mm. of on that whole like dovetailing off of that confidence thing a bit. Uh, you call it something in the, your book, resistance, a resistance spin. Yes. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. And why? And like that happens, I'm sure. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So a resistance spin comes up that, you know, and it kind of has to do with whenever we are expanding out, whenever we're trying something new or whenever we are growing to a next level. So this is whether you're starting out or whether you've been doing what you do for a while, but you're going to that next level. You're, you're always going to have a full on identity crisis. So it's like, you, you kind of have to plan for that. You have to plan for the anxiety, the fear, the like, oh my gosh, what am I thinking? What am I doing now? You kind of have two choices at that point. You will start to try to resist because that's the natural way that the brain wants to try to keep us safe is by like, nope, we can't do that. That's dangerous. That's new. That's, that's big. Let's stay small, let's stay safe. And so you can go into the resistance spin where you just keep resisting any kind of support, opportunity, new ideas, new possibilities that come your way. Or you can be aware of like, oh, I see it. I'm having a resistance spin. I'm just in the spin. It's not, it's it's something that's kind of happening to me right now, but it's not necessarily real. It's kind of highly delusional. We completely created ourselves and then freak out as to why it's happening. Right. Tailspin and yes. the whole thing. Yeah. And so it's it's about being aware that that's that that's what it is. And you can see it in moments of, you know, let's say if something great happens and then all of a sudden like you start to get knots in your stomach, you know, or um a lot of times things will happen to me if, if I, if I feel like I'm expanding or, you know, I'm, I'm hitting this goal that maybe I once thought was impossible. I'll start to kind of get a knot in my throat because it's like, Oh, you're speaking your truth. You're speaking up, you're speaking out. And that's that, that safety resistance wanting to kind of hold me back. And so great. I see that you're there. I'm aware that you're there, but I'm going to let you pass and like, know that this is just temporary. That's my and then I can go to that next stage. So that's what I call uh, the resistance spins will come up. And they're, they're just those moments of you having this identity crisis of, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Can I really pull this off? Am I capable enough? All of those things that come into play. Isn't that more like imposter syndrome though? It can be. Yeah, right? that can be a part. Perfectionism can be a resistance spin. Control can be a re- resistance spin. Complacency. Um, distraction can be a resistance spin. Imposter syndrome, that's a big one for me, can be a resistance spin. It's a big one for a lot of people. Yeah. And we we're talking about that, I think, at the beginning of this podcast. What are some ways then, let's just stay with that for one second. When this happens, this whole resistance spin, mm-hmm. imposter and, and scrolling it, is a resistance that's spin. That's a big one. It's, well, this is all just, oh, that's a distract. Yeah, that's yep. a big distraction, distraction to kind of get away from like what you're feeling. I think people use that all the time. Mm-hmm. What are ways that people, how, how about you? Not about ways. What do you do when you feel that imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. and how do you like, how do you kind of get yourself out of it? Yeah. So there's two, there's two resistance spins I can get in. So the first one with imposter syndrome is, um, and I talk about it in the book a lot that these old stories and, um, belief systems from my origin story will come up of like, you don't belong. Who do you think you are? You know, I mentioned that Mm -hmm. earlier, like, you know, you're a fraud, you're going to be found out, which is like my biggest fear of being found out. Um, which again, is highly like being found out for what, you know, but it's like, you know, the thing with the credit card is a perfect example of like, I manifested being found out and then I was found out. Right. So when, when those things come up, I'm first aware, cause I'm so clear of what that story is now that when I have those thoughts, I'm like, okay, this is what's happening. Um, if it's at night when I'm asleep, I will sit up, I'll get a glass of water, I'll try like a breathing technique or something just to try to calm my nervous system Does it happen down. Off, like often? Not, it's it's happened very recently because I have a book coming out and I've never done this before. Right. So right. just to be completely candid, like there's been moments like that, that I'll, you know, sometimes when I'm watching something, like I was watching this show called Re- We Crashed, We Crashed recently. I just watched it. I loved it. Yes. Yeah. I thought it was fascinating, yeah. but because he was expanding at such a high rate. I totally and then, know what you're talking about. Yeah. And then I, I just start, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is possible. Like, what if this had like, uh, uh, you know, it was just this irrational fear that I had. And so I had to like, even though I love the show, like in that moment, I had to stop watching. I was like, this is not, (laughs) this is not making me feel good. So really tapping in with you, right? right. Yeah. It resonated like his, his desire to dream big, but then him overspending. And that's my trigger. 
And yes. so it was just that fear that was coming up. And he got ousted for it. And he did. He got yeah. ousted for it. So like, I've been there. I know that. Um, so that was a thing for me. And then, um, and then I think if, if whatever environment you're in, when those things come up, if you can try to do like the anticip the antithesis for that. So for me, a lot of times I try to move my body because when I am in movement, when I'm in physical movement and it doesn't have to be some, you know, hit class, I can literally just be walking outside mm -hmm. the energy moves. And so it's, it's hard for me to stay in this frozen fear of anxiety or whatever the resistance is when I'm not resisting physical motion. Right. So to me, movement is key. Water is key. Breath. I mean, very basic <laughs> things that we can do helps me a lot. Um, the other distraction that can happen, the other one that can happen to me is distract, distraction specifically with either busy work or scrolling. So I can get lost in the scroll really easily, or I can start, I'm like, okay, so I have this big thing that I want to do, but it's scary. So I'm going to go over here and like do all this little stuff right now. Mm -hmm. And then that makes me feel accomplished and like good. And I'm checking stuff off the list, but is this busy work really getting me to where I want to go? Probably not. So I'm after only laughing because that's how I felt yesterday. And then, then I like was so like overwhelmed. I went to Costco when like the worst day possible, like at five o'clock in the evening when like I should be doing like actual things that right. I need to get done. I'm going to go to Costco. Yeah. I know and, the answer. And waste two hours, oh, right. you know, right. but I'm at least going to Costco to buy paper towels right. that I could Instacart. But yeah. Yes. You know, and ridiculous. to me, it's just the aware, you know, because you can laugh about it because you're like, I, I know exactly what I'm doing. It doesn't mean that you're going to get it right or perfect every time, but at least you notice, okay, I did that. I know why I did that. I'm going to go easy on myself for doing that. And now tomorrow I'm going to try to commit to a plan to at least focus on this thing that it may be big and scary. I may be avoiding it, but I know that it's important to get me to where I want to go. Well, I think it's very hard for a lot. I mean, no one's perfect. I mean, no, like all of this is great and said and, and like in theory, but we're all human beings, right? right? And like, we all have our things that trigger us, all things that we kind of fall to. And it's like a normal, as long as you're doing well, most of the time, you're right. allowed to kind of have these like Costco, you know, rush hour Costco for three hours. Right. Right. And like, like to your point like you have to be able to give yourself like the permission to be like, not great all the time. Right. Cause it's normal. Right. You'd be like very like weird and abnormal if you were going to be consistently good all, all the, the time. time. I mean, we're not robots. And I think there's right. also a difference between giving yourself a break and a resistance spin. And only you're going to kind of know where that fine line is. But sometimes I do just need to watch, you know, Netflix and just take a break. Yeah. You know, totally. sometimes I just need to watch a, a show and kind of zone out because my mind has been going a mile a minute so long. But that's when you also have to have the awareness to really be in tune with your body and check in with your thoughts and feelings and your in your physicality just to say, okay, am I, am I kind of sloughing out right now because I don't want to deal with life or like, am I taking a break that's actually rejuvenating for me? Yes, I agree. So when you say get what you want as a title of a book, mm -hmm. right? Are you talking about then strictly get what you want as a personal brand in, in any kind of career person or like your personal life? Is it very much about what you get, what you want overall like what is your yeah to me it's more about you getting what you want out of your life because that trickles into everything right. yes we there's some business and branding stuff in here because that's what I do and right. I love to teach on it but this really does start with the inside job that is you and it's what is keeping you stuck from you getting what you want how can we work on getting to the other side of that so that you're in a place where you feel aligned you feel excited right. you feel confident you feel worthy to get what you want and then that changes changes your, your relationship with yourself, your relationship with other people, your business, how you lead, how you show up in the world, your beliefs about yourself and your ability to impact, no matter if you, you know, want to be this right. global leader, or if you just, you're, you're a mom and maybe you're part of the PTA and you just want to be able to make more of an impact in that group. There's nothing is too small based off of whatever is relative to you. Um, but you are, since you, you do kind of like focus a lot on the podcast on personal branding and on business. Cause you know, that's and like you said, it does of course trickle through. Like, I mean, it does, everything bleeds into each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, could we just talk, could you talk about this? I think it's very important for women, especially who to negotiate on their own behalf. Like once yeah. you like, for example, when you're doing this remodeling thing with, with 
was it called cost market? Oh, world market. World yeah, market. Cost right. plus. Mm-hmm. Uh, or in any brand deal, right? For any, or, or a lot of different things. People tend to, women especially, tend to not be their best, best PR people all mm-hmm. the time or their best like agents, let's just say. Right. Can you talk about some ways and strategies that people can become better at negotiating for themselves? Yeah. Because I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. um, You bring up a great point because I think for a lot of women, we feel that negotiation is sleazy or slimy or salesy. Heaven forbid we (laughs) sell anything. Right. Um, And so we have this very negative kind of connotation. But honestly, when you think about it and maybe think back into your own life, really anything that you've negotiated you know, it probably hasn't been sleazy or slimy. You know, it's it's it does come from an authentic place because most people are not sleazy and slimy. Most people want to, you know, do the best that they can and be the best that they can and really come from a service-based place. So if that is you, which I'm sure it is for anyone that's listening to this, the the I have this kind of magical question that through my years of negotiating things for myself and then just teaching the art form that is negotiation, this is a magic question that really opens up the possibility to negotiate, which is just negotiation is nothing but just a compromise of like, hey, how can two people kind of meet and agree and and everybody win? So the question is, what would it take? That's it. What would it take to to do this collaboration with you? What would it take for us to go to the movies? What would it take to get that new puppy that I want to get? What would it take to buy this house? What would it take to meet for lunch tomorrow? What would it take? And that question alone, it opens up so much possibility because what it does is that it it provides consent for the other person to then respond to you. And it also empowers the other person to give you their thoughts and feedback. And the more that people feel like they are part of the solution, the more excited that they're going to be to find and create a solution. So it's not just this one sided thing where I want to make sure I get what I want. But what would it take to make sure that we can both get what we want? But what happens a lot of times is for women, uh, they end up taking less than they deserve because they don't want to be that salesperson or they're uncomfortable. Yes. How do you, what do you say to people or yourself? Like, what do you do mm-hmm. to kind of overcome that like awkwardness? Because to negotiate on your own behalf is very, it could be very uncomfortable. Yeah. And so do you have any strategies for that? Like, so that you're not like, kind of like, You're not kind of just like acquiescing to like the first bid, so to speak. Right. right? So when it comes to numbers and like with any kind of pricing with negotiating, the biggest issue that I see a lot of when women make is that they will either throw out a number and accept that or they they will throw out some kind of number that is actually a lot lower and a lot less than what they really want. Mm -hmm. Or they will accept the first offer that comes to them. There's no negotiating in that. Right. There was no, you're just throwing out a number, accepting an offer. So the first thing that I always tell women is that if you throw out a number and someone immediately says yes to you and does not negotiate with you, you you're underpricing yourself. Yeah. That's always the first sign. It should be a little like, I don't want to say painful, but like when money is an exchange of energy, it should be a little uncomfortable for you to throw a number out and also a little uncomfortable for this person to say, okay, I'm ready to step up and, and kind of go here. It's all about the perceived value. And so the va- it first starts with you. You have to value yourself enough to put out into the world what it is that you want and to be unabashedly, to own yeah. that unabashedly. The second thing is don't put out a number. I think what also helps women, and this is what I teach in my program, instead of just putting out a number, put a range out. Because that's going to give you some negotiation room and some wiggle room to have more possibilities of negotiation of negotiating. If you just throw a number out, you you lose any power to negotiate because you're just basing everything off that number. That one number. Whereas if you say, okay, I have this idea or, you know, I want to collaborate with you on this. And here are a couple of things that I could do. And, you know, this would cost, you know, here to here. What are your thoughts? So you, okay, so how many courses do you have? I know you have the pitch it. Yep. I have a course on pitching and then, um, and then I have a membership, um, and then I have like higher level, you know, coaching opportunities. So what, what do you get with a membership? What's a membership? This is like, so you really do a lot of, a lot of like personal, 
uh, like, do you do personal coaching, like one-on-one or is it all like in groups? I can't, yeah, I, I can do one-on-one and I will do one-on-one, but those are rare. Um, okay. I only offer like several of those throughout the year. And then I have more group containers. So I have a mastermind that's a group container that also does involve one-on-one coaching inside that container. So it's a group gathering, but then you get one-on-one coaching. So what's in there. with these masterminds? I know a bunch of people <laughs> love these masterminds on online. That's what I was going to say. You're, you do a lot of online marketing. Yes. Like that's really what I think is that your sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that I do is online. It's, it's all online mm-hmm. marketing. So like, you know, then I didn't even get into, so you're very good with like giving people the tools to build their personal brand. So right. when this whole get what you want situation, it's really great for that. Like you're really, really lining up the steps the formula that you need to build these things. Cause yes. people don't, re- there's a lot of like, people think, Oh yeah, you just do this. Well, no, 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 no. It's not that simple. Right. Um, but okay. So what, what is these masterminds? Why are they important? What do you learn in them? How expensive are they? I just want to understand this. Yeah. So a mastermind is typically, I mean, I think that that word's been thrown around a lot. And I think that a lot of people have created versions of whatever they think that is for them, which is all fine. For me, a mastermind is a group of masters that come together to, and when I say masters, they're, they're people that are at the top of their field, they're leaders in the, their field, they're, they're great at what they do, and they come together and bring their minds together to support one another in getting to that next level. Mm, okay. So every mastermind can have its kind of like you know, based off of the host of the mastermind, they're going to have their flavor and their flair and kind of what they focus on. For my mastermind, the focus is on visibility and brand awareness. So the women in my mastermind, they come to me, they're all multi six or seven figure earners. Are they all women, by the way? They're all women. Okay. They've done very well in their business, but they have this one little problem. No one really knows who they are on a national scale. Mm -hmm. So they can't get a book deal. They can't speak on the stages. They're not, you know, when someone thinks about the wellness industry, they're not thinking about them. Mm -hmm. So they, they've already laid the foundations of their business. That's good. What they're wanting support in is visibility, exposure, impact, and, and really being able to influence on a greater scale. Got it. Okay. So they come together. And then with me hosting it, we support one another in raising that visibility. And so what they're really learning are ways to kind of lay that groundwork, which I can teach, but then they're also learning from each other. And I think a true mastermind is not really a coaching container as much as it's a collaboration container and networking container for the people in the mastermind to learn and grow from one another. I like the way you just described that. And so how long do these last How much do these cost? Yeah, so it depends on the host and how it is. There's some that can last for a year. There's some that can last for six months. That long? Yeah, for a year. Wow, and so you join a mastermind and how often do you meet? Like once a week, once a month, once a... Yeah, my mastermind is six months. Okay. Um, I have done them in a year, but I feel like that's kind of too... That's just long. me personally, that's just too long. Um, but six months, I think, is a great sweet spot from what I've tested. And I, I've also been in masterminds that are a year long or six months, and they both have their values, but... You've been in, you've been in some too? Yeah, I've been in a ton. And it's helped you a lot? For sure. Really? That is like... I tell anybody, like, you want to grow your business on like a bigger scale, get in a mastermind. That's where you, that's where I've met everybody. That's where I've networked. That's where I learned because you're putting yourself in these really intimate spaces to learn about the intricacies of how other people have been able to build their business Absolutely, in a way that you're never going to hear that on a podcast episode or, you know, on at some big conference, you're getting really intimate with the inner workings of how people have grown and scaled. And just the insight, if you get in the right room with the right people, the insight that you can can, that you can learn is just, it's priceless. Wow. Um, and just the people alone that you meet. And so how many have you done? Would you say I have done one, two, I've done three, I've been in three masterminds myself. And then I have hosted, this is my third year of hosting a mastermind. Wow. So which masterminds did you do? So I did one that was hosted by a woman named Melissa Griffin, um, who's actually no longer in the online space, but that was the very, very first one I did. And then I did two more that were peer based. So we were all kind of the hosts. So there was a group of us that came together from various masterminds and said, let's just create our own. And then we'll meet once a month and we'll do our in-person retreats and we'll kind of co-create it and co-host it together. 
And how many people were in this mastermind? About 15 of us. And how did you find them? Like what did, what's the process of finding them? Being on people's emails. And then I got an email in my inbox that said, Hey, I'm launching a mastermind. If you qualify, you know, based off of this, this, and this, you can apply. And that's what I did. So then you started your own, your, your own yes. mastermind. And that's six months long, six months long. And masterminds can range. They're high end. They can range anywhere from, you know, typically about $25,000 upwards to 50, 60 grand a year. For a, and then, so so then you meet, like you said, give me the, the parameters of how you meet. Like, would it be, you said once a week? Yeah, so how we do it is once a month, we will have a call um, that is specific to a certain topic. So, you know, podcast visibility or, you know, um, how to get a publishing deal or, you know, whatever whatever the collective group is most interested in learning, we'll curate it around that. But it's it's always around, for mine, it's always around PR, visibility, media, and you put, do you branding. Put, do you put the content together? I do. Do. So you put all that content together and you say, okay, people, I'm just making this. Right. What do you guys want to talk about? You figure that all out and you mm -hmm. say, okay, this one's going to be about podcasting. Right. This call. Right. Or it's going to be about, okay, continue. This Brand is very awareness, interesting. Or it's going to be about this or that. And so um, sometimes we have guest speakers, which is great because it allows them to meet really influential people. And that again is just based on my own network of right. people that I know. Um, sometimes it's me just hosting it. How long is the call, by the way? About 60 minutes. So about an hour. Okay. Hour. And that's once a month. That's once a month. Okay. Because here's the thing. When you're just starting out or when you're like a, you know, a low six figure or high five figure owner, you may have more time to go to more coaching calls, but people that are, people that are running businesses and have a team and are, like, they don't have time to get on 15,000 coaching calls. Like, no, they do not. They want to get in, you know, network, hear from other people, build those relationships and get out. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of forum and YPO. Do you know what YPO is? Uh, Young Presidents young, Organization. Yeah. Yeah. I have an idea about what it is. It, it's very similar to, to that kind of model. Yes. So is there qualifications for people yes. to get into the mastermind or mm -hmm. can any Joe Blow just say, Hey, I want to be in this no. mastermind. The way that we do it, it's application only. Okay. You have to have a solidified business in the marketplace. It is making multi six to seven figures. Cause we want to make sure that people are kind of on the similar right. level. There's, right. Um, for mine, you have to be a woman. Um, <laughs> and, um, that would help. And yes. then, and then you have to specifically like brand awareness has to be something that's a main focus for you. Like if you're focused on, you know, funnels or like wanting someone to help you, like there may be other things that we offer for that, but that's not what we're focusing on in the mastermind. Got it. You have to be somebody that wants to, to be networking and, and meeting people and that sort of thing. Um, and then we have like in-person retreats, you know, one retreat during the six month period. So we get to meet in person. So one time. One time. For how long? For a weekend. And can it be, who decides where to go? I guess you're like, okay, we're going to go to wherever. Right. This for two, place, three days. For, yep. For usually it's about two days. Um, and then one day is typically, you know, us kind of deep diving, working together on stuff. It, it's also great because it gives women time and space to like, like not be distracted by, by life and kids and everything else. Like you're really giving yourself this time to be here, to work on your goals, to work on your vision, yeah. um, to meet other people. Yeah. Um, and it's really just creating what is like a sacred space for that time. And then we've got, we have fabulous dinners and, you know, gift bags and all, you know, all kinds of fun stuff, but every mastermind is different. I always tell anyone if they're interested in joining a mastermind, the big thing for me is that you want to make sure that you're joining a mastermind that is led by someone who has done what it is that you are trying to do. Yeah. They don't just talk about it, but they, they've done it. So if, if you want to write a book, go be in a mastermind by someone who's actually written a book. Absolutely. If you want to speak on a stage, go be in a mastermind with somebody who's spoken on stage. If you want to launch a successful podcast, Go be in a mastermind with someone who has actually done that. I think a lot of times people get burned in masterminds because they join these masterminds that either the format's not right for them or, you know, the leader isn't the right person that that they needed to lead them. It doesn't mean the leader is bad or wrong or anything, but it's just that not you know, right for it's what just they need. not right for what they need. So that's always the big thing for me. You want to make sure that the person has done what it is that you're trying to do. And then you want to make sure that, that the container and the way that it's set up actually lends to support for you. So it's like, how many coaching calls do you have? You know, how many in-person retreats do you have? Like, do I have the space and capacity to show up for these things? Is this important to me? You know, what do I really want out of this experience? Also size. So, so far we got one call a month. 
one retreat for a couple of days. What else do you get for the mastermind? Um, in mine, you do get access to once a month, 20 minute private one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. I have a, I have team members on my team that are coaches. And so those are for just like, again, the resistance spins, any kind of just mm. like mindset, like, oh gosh, this thing happened and I can't seem, get on those calls with, you know, Re Renee and Becca who are amazing coaches on my team. They will support you through that process and kind of any of those triage moments that you can have. And I think that's important. And, you know, some members take us up on it. Some members never do them. You know, it's just yeah. really just there if you need it. Um, and then they also get, we use Slack. So they get Slack access to a private Slack channel. To all of them together. All of them together to talk. We also um, How many have, women did you say go into? It's usually between about 12 to 18. Last year we had 18. This year we have 14. That's still a lot though. It is. Yeah. It's, it's manageable. I think that if you start to get over 20, that's when it becomes more of like a YPO situation mm -hmm. and not really more of an intimate setting. Well, YPO is chapter based. Right. And then in that chapter, how it works is you have forums you, right. and people break out into their forums and you become very close with your forum, with the forum, right. not so necessarily the chapter. Um, and the forums are usually like six people, right. seven people, Yeah. but it's very concentrated. It's like seven, like four hours or more every three weeks, let's say once a month, or I can't remember how much, but, and you, there's, there's very, very particular like guidelines and you cannot, if you, you cannot miss it or you get kicked out, you cannot do this. Right. You can't answer your phone. I mean, and it's very concentrated. For people. Right. So that's why I was curious. It seems similar in the sense of like, like-minded people who have the same level in terms, like people who are in the same ilk success wise. Right. That can Not the from. same industry necessarily. Not the same industry. But you know, at all. we've got people, we have online coaches. I have a dairy farmer in oh, my mastermind. Wow. Really? I have a cattle rancher. Yeah, they know each other and they're launching this podcast together, but she's like the top cattle rancher and then the other one's the top dairy farmer in their space. And they want to build more awareness for the ag agriculture space. Um, That's great. And then you come up with all the content for the call. The content, yeah, the container, how it's modeled, how it's shifted. Um, and I also too, we're not as structured, like with what you were just mentioning, if someone can't make a call, I'm not kicking them out. Like I let... <laughs> You're adults, like yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. is here for you. If you, if you, you know, you, you kind of, you get what you put in. So, yeah. you know, we do have certain members that they're not going to miss a call. And that's how I always was in a mastermind. Like if, if I'm, I'm investing this, kind of money, right. I'm not, I'm not missing, missing a call. I'm not, but then you have other people that are like, whatever. Yeah, I'm good. I got what I need. I'm going to go back and kind of do my thing. I'll see you guys soon. And it's nothing personal. Everyone just does what's best for them. But, and on, then, but on a call, if you're leading the call, do you guys all have like a, like an itinerary that you guys are following? There's kind of a topic or theme for that call, but there's not there's not an itinerary. And people ask questions mm -hmm. and talk amongst each other. So which are you more of a moderator? Um, a little bit, but I also guide the conversations and I'll, yeah. you know, if someone asks my opinion, I always, I I'm, I'm a coach. So if someone needs to be, yeah. I'm not going to be like, I can't coach you right now. Right, you know, right, it's right. like, I will definitely give perspective, get, give feedback coach, but then we also lean on each other for the support too. So you find obviously a very big value in, in, in doing these things. So. A million percent. I mean, wow. Okay. So I don't even know how long this podcast has been going. I think I've covered like everything. And then some, I was going to ask you all about like email marketing and all this other stuff, but God knows how long has it been? It's been an hour and 15 minutes. Oh my and God, Lord. Is. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm like going on and on. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we can, if you want to touch upon the importance of like, when you build, like what I was saying to, uh, saying to you earlier is that when you build personal brands, like a lot of people are missing very like key components. And when I was listening to your podcast, you had someone on that you guys are talking about email lists and mm -hmm. the, the importance of building this. If you want to build a personal brand, we don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but let's just touch upon it because I know how value I, I found value in it. And if people are listening to this and they are trying to build their personal brand and they're trying to get what they want and they want to, you know, they want to be able to, to kind of uh, self-actualize, this is a very big piece of it. So can we just touch upon that quickly? Yeah, you know, email marketing is a huge part to brand awareness for various reasons. But I think for the main reason is because when someone subscribes to your email, they are raising their hand to say, I want you to email me. I want the content that you're creating. I want you to, to come into my inbox, which is a very intimate and private space. To get access to someone's inbox is 
insanely valuable, way more valuable than a social media engagement followers could ever be. And so that's really the importance that I think that for someone that, you know, that wants to, and it's about getting clear on what you want to do. If you want to write a book, if you want to create your own products or services or offers of of any kind in the future, if you want to speak on stages, if you want to be able to target your ideal audience in a more engaged and impactful way with the hopes of converting into something, then you absolutely need an email list. Um, And so that's why email lists have been around for (laughs) ever since email has been around. They're not going anywhere. That's why I wanted to bring it up, the conversion is super high with an email list versus focusing on just using social media platforms. Correct. Because that to me is a fickle business. You're relying on like Mark Zuckerberg or whoever it is to change that. And then you're kind of screwed. Yes. So you have to take ownership in your stuff. And that's why when, when I listened to that, I was like, you know what, this is a very, I'd like to just even talk about just a little bit. Um, because it is really important if you're selling anything, if you want to have a voice or, connect to your audience. Yeah. It's super important. It's have. it's super important. And, and it's kind of what I was saying about earlier, even if you're someone who you don't manage like the inner workings of setting your email, mm-hmm. you know, marketing campaign up, or you don't manage the day to day of the back end of it, you at least need to understand it conceptually. You need to understand how it works. You know, what's the strategy behind it? how it's going to work to help you get your goals and how you can better improve on it. What information do, do you put in the email marketing? Like what do you put in these emails or the new, it's like a newsletter basically. It is. I mean, it really just depends on what you're focusing on and what you're potentially selling at the time. I mean, I always say that your most valuable pieces of information need to go into an email with my emails. For example, I do whenever I have a podcast episode come out, I send an email about it. This helps build up the podcast numbers. It allows my email list to know that there's a new podcast to listen to. Mm-hmm. A lot of my listeners are on my email list. So this is their, their weekly reminder. And I've been doing it for so long, they expect it. They know that every Wednesday, they're going to get an email from Julie that lets them know about the new podcast episode. Love it. And so give some ways people can start building up their email list. Yeah. So I think the easiest ways to get started um, and what I talked about on the conversation that you're mentioning is they're, they're called freebies. It's a free piece of content that you create that allows someone to opt in to your email list. That is typically the lowest barrier of entry and the easiest way to start building an email list. You want to create quality freebie, quality free content that's going to make someone be interested to opting in to receiving more. And you want to do it in a way that that content, it's not just some random piece of content that you're creating, but it actually, that content actually relates back to the services, the offers, the podcast, whatever it is that you have that you're wanting to generate more traffic awareness conversion from. And so by the way, you really are like an expert in all online, anything online marketing, really. <laughs> Been doing you're this like, for a long you're time. You're like a, a wealth of information, <laughs> I swear. Uh, so is, you have to write a newsletter You got and you put whatever information in there. How do you get people to open that letter, the newsletter? Because I think a lot of people don't get that open, right? Yeah, I mean, you can do your best with making sure your subject lines are attractive with, you know, building that know, like, and trust over time. But, you know, it's really they've got to be interested in opening it. And so um, those were kind of, I think, the two key areas. Your your subject line is juicy enough. Are they just like you a lot that they're opening your emails? How did you get your podcasters to get onto the email list? I created freebies. So at the end of every podcast episode, if you wanted X, Y, and Z, head over to this link and get this freebie. And then that's how you can build the list from that. Those, what kind of freebies did you give away? Whatever the episode topic generally was, since I'm so education based, yeah. a lot of what I teach are strategies or tips great, or yeah. checklists or how to's. And so if somebody wanted to take that content with them when they, when they left the, the, the show, they could, you know, download it in a freebie form. Amazing. Julie, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you for having me. No, it was, you, fun. It was great. I learned so much and I <laughs> loved your book. Get what you want. Thank you. No, yes. You're welcome. And you can get it wherever you love to buy books, wherever books are sold. It's going to be there. We also have an audible, which I recorded and I highly recommend for anyone who maybe you don't like to read books, but you like to listen to books, which I know a lot of podcasters just do. You can definitely check it out on audible. Um, it's also great to kind of the way that I love to learn, because there's a lot in here at the end of every chapter I have, it's like basically, you know, where you can write in it. There's a lot of like workbook and how to stuff in here. Um, you could listen to it and then write it at the same time. That helps me kind of learn. I love better. that. There are a lot of exercises. It's very actionable. 
and you did a great job with it for, Thank you. for your first book. And it's, it's very well done. And like I said, it's, it's very, I like it cause it gives people very much like actionable ways to kind of do what they need to do yeah. to be successful. It's not just a bunch of like blah, blah, blah. Be yourself. Work. Yeah. <laughs> be yourself. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You are enough. Right. Um, so be authentic. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. So it was that easy. Then none of us would be here. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you. Where do people find you? Just on Instagram? Yeah. And- so I, I tend to hang out most on Instagram. It's at Jules, J-U-L-S Solomon, S-O-L-O-M-O-N. And then Julie Solomon dot net is my website where you can find all the other information. And then of course, the influencer podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Habits and hustle. Time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind. Don't stop. Keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries. Tune in. You can get to know them. Be inspired. This is your moment. Excuses. We ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle podcast. Powered by Habit Nest.